Welcome to Across the Margin, the podcast, where I take you beyond the margin, behind the scenes of the online magazine, and deeper into the stories. I am your host, Michael Shields, and faithful listeners, who I am ever so grateful for, might be asking yourselves, what was that they just heard? That novel and enticing introductory music. Well, that, my friends, was Beyond the Margin's new opening, and a huge thank you is in order, as just like the previous composition, this new theme music was crafted by the incredibly talented Tom Rao, a true friend of the podcast. Tom Rao is a multi-instrumentalist, writer, and artist hailing from Durham, North Carolina, and straight up one of the most fascinating human beings I know. I just flew down to Durham and worked on this opening with Tommy, him doing the heavy lifting, of course, and uh, I love what became of it. I hope everyone out there does as well. Um, Thank you, Tommy. All love. Your involvement in the project over the years has really meant the world to us over here. Today's podcast is one I'm thrilled about, as it features an interview I conducted with Andrew Jenks, an award-winning filmmaker, television producer, writer, and podcaster. Andrew's latest project is a podcast series called What Really Happened, a podcast that examines and contextualizes famous figures and historical events while discovering untold stories and unraveling newfound narratives. It's incredible in a series I am totally hooked on and proud to shine a light on. It features episodes about Winston Churchill, Michael Jordan, Britney Spears, Bridgegate, the secret sonic war in Cuba, Muhammad Ali, and more. I am truly excited for you all to learn more about this. Prior to What Really Happened, Andrew has made a whole slew of fascinating, important documentary films. One is about the ills of our justice system, another is about living with AIDS, There's a documentary about Bobby Valentine. There's one about an all-deaf high school football team. And we do, uh, we we pretty much touch on all these in our discussion as well. The level of research Andrew puts into his work is flat-out dumbfounding. He even even surprised me in the interview by quoting back to me one of my favorite authors. And uh, I'm not sure where he rooted that info out from, but uh, he came equipped with it. And... uh, and because of this research that he does in his work, the stories that he tells, they're, they're overflowing with all these stories inside of stories inside of stories. And, and this, uh, this approach fashions his work entirely enthralling and, and, and completely informative. Uh, personally, he's a fascinating and awesome person. And um, I just I have no doubt you're going to enjoy this discussion as much as I did. And, and you really got to check out um, what really happened. It's, uh, it's the truth. Before we go any further, I'd like to remind you that Across the Margin, the podcast, is part of the Osiris Podcast Network. Osiris is a community of podcasts that connects you to great music, history, arts and culture podcasts, and to live events. Go to OsirisPod.com and check out all the exciting podcasts they have to offer over there. Um, they, we do have one new edition over there that I'm really feeling. It's called Dark Blue, and it's hosted by Jeffrey Rickley. He's the lead songwriter and singer for the band Thursday. Uh, Dark Blue is an exploration of the lives of musicians and artists and the way they have dealt with health, trauma, and other issues. It's a, it's a deep podcast. It's, it's having some mental health discussions that, um, that are super important, and uh, you should definitely give it a run. So uh, let's dig in. Here is my interview with Andrew Jenks. Andrew, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to uh, talk to me today. I really appreciate it. Love the show. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming by. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, I have looked at uh, all the work you've done, all the all the storytelling you do, and I'm, I'm just really curious. How did you get into uh, storytelling, filmmaking, uh, documentary filmmaking, everything? I mean, it looks like you, uh, you had some successes at an early age, too. Uh, when I was, well, I had a public access TV show in high school. Amazing. 
which I was quite proud of, that yeah. was on Channel 6, which was between Fox 5 and ABC 7, and redid us redid a... Right here in New York, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And redid an uh, interview with a kid from my high school that got suspended for... I think he was dealing weed or something. That's hard-hitting news. Hard-hitting news, yeah. so much so that we got canceled, <laughs> which I think were the first ever public access show to get canceled. Yep. Uh, and then, so I was 19. I was at NYU. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't having a good time. I was also just going through a, you know, um, what was like, what is pretty much lifelong chronic depression, if you will, yeah. and uh, was just sort of sorting that out on my own for the mm -hmm. first time. And was with 300 strangers in a in a dormitory at NYU. At yeah. the same time, my grandfather, who was a genius and invented all these different things, was going through dementia. Uh, and I had visited him at a nursing home, and he had forgotten my name. And and there was a few different things that happened where I thought, you know, I hate college. Uh, my grandfather's in an interesting position where he's with 300 strangers in a different kind of dormitory yeah. on the other oh, wow. side of life. So you're putting parallels between Yeah, them. and I thought, what would, you know, what would life be like on the other side of the spectrum? Mm. So I tried moving in to his nursing home and make a, with the idea being to make a documentary about it because of various HIPAA violations yeah. and different things. So that's room 335? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I called, to make a long story, well, it's still kind of long here, <laughs> uh, I called 30 different nursing homes or so, uh, not an exact, like at least 30. Mm -hmm. And then eventually one in Florida said they would uh, let me come in, let me bring two cameras that I bought off of eBay and um, let me stay there for free because I didn't have any money and uh, lived there for five weeks, made a movie about what that was like. Mm -hmm. And then to make a long story short, HBO caught wind of it and bought it. And, um, awesome. and so that's how I kind of got started in this, in the, at least in the documentary world. Yeah, cool. You seem to have... Um a natural curiosity and, and you kind of, uh, you know, that shines through in all your work, whether it's your documentaries or onto this uh, awesome podcast. Uh, is it, you know, where'd that come from? Is that you've always had that? Natural curiosity? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you kind of looking to root things out and get to a truth. That's what I see from what really happened. Uh, right? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, I'm trying to think of, I think that has always been the case to some extent, uh, probably to get, out of my own head a little bit mm -hmm. and um, escapism, escapism of some sort. And so, you know, when we were, my dad worked for the United Nations, so he traveled quite a bit when I was a kid. And so I was in a lot of countries where people didn't speak English. And so my uh, escape was oftentimes this big, bulky VHS camera we yeah. had. And I'd go around just filming shit. Okay. And uh, we're, we're, we can curse, right? Yeah, all, day, um, all day long. All day long. Yeah. So uh, uh, just filming, like, the grass growing and narrating what it was like for the grass to be grew. Like, mm -hmm. you'd, I'd find the weirdest of things. And so I think... Um, that's the curiosity. That's I'm the curiosity, yeah. I guess, that you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. So uh, let's dig into the um, this podcast, which, uh, again, it's great. It's... it's uh, I'm, I'm kind of hooked. I'm definitely... I'm, I'm, I'm going to be with this ride for, for oh, till nice. the end. But uh, I got to ask, how do you choose your topics and stories because, I mean, we bounce around from talking about Muhammad Ali to mm -hmm. Bridgegate to mm -hmm. Michael Jordan to Princess Diana, uh, a lot of Churchill. Churchill. Uh, we'll get Britney Spears. Britney. Britney's in the house. Britney, uh, bitch. How do, you, uh, how do you choose your topics? So I was doing some, my research on um, Mike here before I came, and I found a good uh, <laughs> Kurt Vonnegut quote that you apparently <laughs> like, uh, which I thought was quite good myself. This might be the first time I have been researched back by somebody. Well, I'm not, I'm not just anyone. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so he said, uh, he being Kurt Vonnegut, but for all intents and purposes, you, mm -hmm. uh, said, find a subject you care about and which you and your heart feel others should care about. It is this genuine caring, not your games with language, which will be the most compelling and seductive element in your style. So I think... To that point, I find topics that I just am kind of interested in mm -hmm. and I know people are talking about, yeah. uh, And but I feel like they're kind of talking on the periphery and not necessarily getting to like, all right, well, what, what are we really like? It's like one of those long meetings you have um, if you work in a company or something and there's like that, that meeting with everyone there and it's like 20 people and we're talking, you're talking about a million different things mm -hmm. and then... 
if you kind of, like I used to do this and then I realized it was sort of a jackass move, I, I would sort of stop the meeting and be like, so what are we doing? Yeah. You know, like what's the, what are we actually, what's the purpose yeah. of this? It's like, it works in a lot of things in life, relationships totally. included. Yep. And um, I, uh, I think that's where, where it stems from is like, all right, so we all talk about the Britney Spears meltdown or why Michael Jordan retired. But if we can kind of actually do some research, talk to a lot of the people that were really involved in whatever the event or scenario was and try and create a narrative based on the facts, then we might be able to tell this story in a really honest uh, way. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of follow, following your passion a little bit gets you to the story you want to tell. Yeah. So for none of the topics, are is it is anyone uh, sort of like the 16 topics we have this year were the 16 topics when I walked in for season two and said, these are the 16 that okay. I want. So and it's not a top down so situation. No, you're, you're, the, you're bringing the, what you want to talk about. The weird. Yeah. yeah. the So I so coming from a little bit more of a, at least more recently a television background, mm -hmm. I'm definitely used to. And this not in a bad way, but I'm definitely used to, you know, you work for a network, or at least they're the ones that are paying mm -hmm. the bills for the content you're creating. And uh, you know what the demo is of that network. Mm -hmm. So if the network is 18 to 24 year olds, 70, 30 skewing female, I still have the creative freedom to do what I want, but I'd be an idiot not to be considering yeah, what that demo is. Yeah. And what I found with podcasts and working with Cadence 13 and seven bucks is total freedom mm -hmm. where they're like, you talk about what you want to talk about, look into what you want to look into to the point where I almost thought there was something wrong. I remember <laughs> I had to email the guys in charge here, I think a day or two before our first episode aired and was like, so is anyone, you know, I was used to like network notes yeah, and all these yeah. things. And everyone's like, no, man, we're just pumped. We can't uh, wait for this thing to come <laughs> out. You know? don't listen to this. Today. So, so, yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's this kind of like uh, story, uh, this, you know, if I, it's kind of like any artist, if, if I dare say so, like a dream mm. where you have an incredible support team that's there for, for you in whatever way that may be. Mm. Uh, and allowing you to do your thing and not get in the way. They give opinions and thoughts yeah. on everything, but uh, it's it's um, it's kind of like the Wild West, which I which I very yeah. much enjoy. Yeah, absolutely, that's what it's pretty special. That was a fucking long answer. Yeah. yeah, that was great. That was yeah. good. Uh, was, I Can you cut this down if I start I'm not going? Gonna. Oh, I like okay. that answer. All right, that's a great yeah. answer. Um, You've already mentioned the word a couple of times, research, and that's something I think our podcasts have in common. Yeah, is, I can uh, tell by your notes here. Yeah, I'm looking you see at this. It, yeah, looks like, it looks like a madman. Michael's like got one of those walls. Yeah. But um, uh, I need to ask you. I mean, your your episodes they are so thoroughly researched. It, mm -hmm. It's really intense. What's going on there? Um, tell me, tell, tell <laughs> I like me, that. It's, it's wild. Intense. Tell, tell me a little bit about it. How do you guys do it? Um. So I. About maybe five years ago, made this movie called Dream Killer. Mm -hmm. And it was about the wrongful incarceration of a 19-year-old who went to prison for life mm -hmm. uh, for a murder that he didn't commit and was, in fact, based on somebody else's dream. It's a fucking weird That's story. Fucking yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a guy named Ryan Ferguson in middle America, white dude, good-looking, uh, and I only say that because unlike other movies, which are awesome movies, Central Park Five or mm -hmm. or um, West Memphis, uh, Thin Blue Line, a lot of the victims, as in the the those that are wrongfully incarcerated, um, those individuals, you know, suffered from were convicted because of some element of racism yeah. um, or Lower or class, IQ socioeconomic socioeconomics. Yeah. yeah, there you go, boom. Yeah. And this was not a case of that. It was just uh, how the judicial system is flawed at its core mm -hmm. and uh, how district attorneys have essentially freedom to do whatever they want and get away with it, mm -hmm. which is um, there's no other job out there other than maybe a weatherman where you can get away with always being wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and so from that experience, I really learned, which sounds kind of obvious, but the value of facts. Mm -hmm. I had done 
I don't know, five or six documentaries before that point. Um, had done a couple epi- a couple seasons of TV. Mm-hmm. And with documentaries, you're definitely encouraged. I mean, a big part of it is manipulating footage in an honest way, but you have to manipulate footage once you're That's editing right. or putting in a soundtrack yeah. or sure. these sorts of things. Sure. And after that experience, I just kind of, my story, how I tell stories changed in that I became obsessed and I'm become obsessed with facts Mm -hmm. and making sure that I get everything as accurate as possible. So, uh, I like, I like the word you used intense. Mm -hmm. Uh, others, you know, may say anal, uh, and some, you know, we get it. I sometimes we'll get the facts wrong. We have these reaction episodes on the show. So it's a chance for people to say, you know, you weren't right about this or that. Uh, but for me, it's, uh, how the process works is just researching a topic mm-hmm. endlessly, talking to the right people, uh, double checking that they're saying something that I read from, you know, it's just, it's just kind of like always, always being meticulous. Um, there's not like any sort of, you know, some sort of, uh, grand special, you know, methodology yeah. or something. Yeah. It's it's more of Being just like just reading. What's up? Being as thorough as you can. Being as thorough as you can. Yeah. I like the idea, and you just kind of touched on a little bit that the episode kind of doesn't even end when the episode ends. I mean, you're asking for fan reaction. You're asking mm-hmm. for people to help you get the facts. Can you talk a little bit about the reaction episodes that you just uh, you know mentioned. So there's so many shows I think that have, and just content in general. I feel like. There's always a now the after show Mm -hmm. or for more, go to our website and for fans of different shows. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I think for a lot of shows, it's definitely forced. And I've been a part of shows where uh, we would say, all right, you know, what's the call to action or what do we get people to go? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, this show doesn't, that doesn't really make any sense. Like, yeah. sure, go to this website to watch behind the scenes or to watch mm-hmm. extra footage. But yeah, I'm not sure The Walking Dead needs a whole talk show after, right. after the episode. Right. <laughs> Although, since I assume that I don't watch, but I yeah. assume since it's, it must be rating well otherwise. Yeah, yeah it's still so, there. Yeah. So that, that were, but like yeah. a lot of other, sh- you know, they, and there's these endless meetings about like, all right, how to reintegrate fans and mm-hmm. listeners or viewers and we'll do this and that. And, Opposed to, and I'm getting a little bit on my on my high horse here, do but it, opposed it. to kind of like worrying about the content of the show. Mm-hmm. You know, let's just make this really fucking good, and if it works out like The Walking Dead, mm-hmm. the fans will demand an after show, yeah. and then you'll make an after show or whatever. Yeah. Um, with our with our podcast, what I realized early on, and I don't remember if we thought of this going into it or if it came after doing a few episodes, but was that I'm not a journalist, I'm not a historian. And I have a show called What Really Happened. So I'm going to need people other than myself to fact check Mm -hmm. and to give their own opinion. And if it's just if it's just me, that feels a little bit disingenuous or or just like kind of um, lazy almost. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, all right, what a free open it up to listeners, to people who are on the show even. Sometimes our guests will, will call in and mm-hmm. say, hey, I said this, but I think this would be a better way to put it. And so all of our listeners, in my opinion, are also a voice of the show because it's on them to make sure that we get everything uh, as close to accurate as possible and then mm-hmm. also get opinions. Like yeah. I, I sometimes will give my opinion on something and someone out there oftentimes has a more dynamic mm-hmm. and interesting opinion. So yeah. that's the that's the kind of purpose behind those reaction episodes. It's cool. It's fun as a listener as well. Oh, good, yeah. yeah. Sometimes I think some of them run a little too long, I think. <laughs> we could probably work on that. Um, it's funny. You were saying you aren't a journalist because when you listen to anything you do or what, see anything you do, it seems like you definitely are. So I think you're being a little humble there. There's no, a it's... Journal, a little well, journalistic aspect to what you do, for certain. No, I don't... Um, I definitely sometimes... We'll put on a little bit of false humility, I suppose, okay. but not not with that. Not actually, that I would okay. say because I don't. I think it's it feels like a, a a conversation that they would have at some prestigious college. But um, the reason I say it is because if I'm a journalist 
and it's raining outside, my job is to say, hey, I'm outside and it's raining. Mm -hmm. Here's the here's the proof. And I, I hold journalists in incredibly like high like okay. that's an important ability, like an important job. Whereas a documentary filmmaker, I think, is to uh, have a low angle of the rain, have music coming in, and it's to give you the feeling of what it's like yeah. to be raining, to be raining, to be rainy outside. Yeah. I still need all of those facts that the journalist probably has. Yeah. It's raining. It's da 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 that he that he or she is giving, but I'm kind of manipulating it to give you a feel. And I think what a journalist does is much more important because they, without them, I can't do what I'm doing. Okay. Um, That's fair enough. I kind of made that up as I went, but it sounded pretty <laughs> good, right? It sounds yeah. fantastic. <laughs> let's, um, let's dig into a couple of the episodes some because I want to give uh, the listeners a chance to kind of get a taste of what you do and what we'll offer there. Uh, recently, we talked about the anatomy of a box office flop, yeah. which, uh, which you got a chance to talk to Academy Award winner Andrew Stanton, director yeah. of... Toy Story 1, 2, 3, yeah. Finding Nemo, The Great Wally. Yep. Um, and the Great then Wall. John John Carter, which yeah. was a which was a huge and famous, infamous flop. But yeah. can you tell us about that episode a little bit? So John Carter is based on a series of novels called Princess of Mars, mm -hmm. and it was written by uh, Edgar R. Edgar R. Burroughs, who sold more books in the 20th century than Faulkner, Hemingway combined. combined. I mean, That's he, crazy. yeah, he was prolific and these books, a princess of Mars, these, these, these series of books or novels inspired Superman, Avatar, oh, Star yeah. Wars. And when you read them, it's quite clear why. And it, it's, uh, it's essentially about, uh, a, uh, I mean, it's complicated, but a, 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 a human, uh, a guy whose wife had just died, who finds himself on Mars mm -hmm. and in the middle of a war. And so if you kind of take a step back, it's it's a movie based on the book that inspired every epic superhero movie you've ever seen, mm -hmm. directed by two-time Academy Award winner Andrew Stanton from coming from Disney, so mm -hmm. it's not like some small studio. And it had all of the all of the kind of tenants that you need for a fucking hit. Yeah. Yeah. And that it was not. It ended up losing I mean it didn't it, it, the, it ended up losing somewhere in the 200 250 yeah. million dollar range. Sequels planned that were canned, the whole thing. Two sequ was, I mean it was yeah. written, that's the crazy mm -hmm. thing. The movie was written. That that I didn't know going into yeah. it. I mean think about it. It's written with two other sequels being planned. Yeah. So so when you're writing it, you're leaving some of that open ended. Yeah. You know, it's, it didn't, you know, the whole thing you're thinking of when when you listen to the episode, it just doesn't seem fair to stay and a lot of the everything you go through, all those points you make, it really uh it's it's wild to see it di dissect it like that. It's crazy. What I saw something in pa you said something in passing uh, in that episode that really struck me it was how people seem to relish in, yeah. in the failure. Yeah, how fucked up is that? Like, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, no, it's funny. I um, it's funny you picked up on that actually. Yeah, yeah the the you know it, it, we go through in the episode why it why I, why it seemed like through research that it failed and, yeah. and kind of how, if you almost look at it, like a Jenga set, all of these blocks keep getting removed and then the Mark, whole thing marketing. crashed. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it, it's interesting cause it gets pretty detailed mm -hmm. with that set. If the film were a masterpiece, I think it would have, it would have survived. Um, but to your, to your point, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I almost went off on a tangent on that point, yeah. but there is something very strange about John Carter, this movie, because, people did relish in it failing, mm -hmm. particularly before it came out when there was signs that it wasn't going to do well. Yeah, the reshoots. And there was like a, there was kind of like this excitement around it. Yeah. And so some people think maybe it had to do also with, well, first off, it's a very human thing yeah. that I don't know enough about, but that like 
when we see something that's perfect fail, I think it makes us feel better. Yep. So in this case, it's a Disney film. It's a two-time Academy Award winning director. And if they fail, yeah. then I think we're kind of like, oh, okay, that, well, that makes me feel yeah. better. It's like when the, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the comparison is. But um, it's, uh, there's some sort of human instinct there that I'm sure Malcolm Gladwell has done a, has done a chapter on. <laughs> and look no it doubt up. About it. <laughs> yeah. um, there was something so incredibly human about um, hearing Stanton, you know, be doubtful about yeah. moving forward right. after that. And, um, and, and so, especially yeah. after such a nuanced, um, you know, breakdown of why it happened. I mean, it's not just on him, of course. And it was, it was very human in that way, which is really, really oh, I'm cool. glad you say that. Yeah. yeah, that was, that's really nice to hear. Because he gave that, I mean, kudos to him for, like, giving Be, me that opportunity. Being that vulnerable, yeah, 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 which yeah. is cool. Um, I love on your storytelling journeys and, and each and every episode that you never know where you're going to go. There's so many stories within stories. I mean, in this one, you, uh, you know, we end up talking about the CIA, yeah, and, and, and right. that, 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 that super fan. Yeah. That, that must have been wild to come upon. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, what was I thinking about? And um, the Ali one, you know, mm. I mean, just that one took us so many different different places. And yeah. So is that's a, that's a unique, I mean, um, skill, it seems, that you have, this kind of intertwined stories within stories type of thing. Is that just happen organically as you move along and do your research and... Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's always been the case uh, since I was 19 and I moved into that nursing home. I didn't, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And, and I learned then that the story will always change. There's a, if, yeah. you're, if you're ready for this, Mike, there's a, there's a really right. cheesy quote, mm -hmm. but it's, 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 it, do, it does justice. <laughs> I'm buckling in. I'm racing um, for it. Yeah. And <laughs> it's, I was roommates with... Uh, when we were both young and broke, uh, with Matt Hyman, who uh, directed uh, Cartel Land, mm -hmm. uh, okay. and also has a new movie out, and is like, he should have been nominated. Anyway, he's he's my my buddy going way back, mm -hmm. and he always has this line that if if your documentary in the end is the same. If your documentary at the end is is, what, let's start Kinda this again. Like the story you set up. Yeah, when when you're at the premiere of your movie mm -hmm. and you're watching it, and if the movie is the same story as you thought it would be at the beginning, mm -hmm. then it means you weren't listening in between. Yeah. And oh, that, wow. Yeah. That's not that's not that cheesy. No, it's fucking money. Is it's what it is. Money, exactly. <laughs> you said you set it up wrong. Um, you lowered the expectations and then just dropped. It's all about the expectations. That's, absolutely. Yeah. Is. That's awesome. And and it comes from Matt Hyman, who's like one of the yeah. more talented and also like the nicest. Hum, like just a gem of a human being, and um, and and I think that's that's really true. Like if they, I think our episodes would be quite boring if 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 it, was if it didn't note. change. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if it. So to your, you know, there's for our John Carter episode. I'm reading a book about John Carter, yeah. and I'm like, who wrote this? Yeah. And then I look into who wrote it, yeah. and it's this guy who's been. Uh, who was an undercover CIA operative for 10 years that led a revolution in Indonesia and ended up getting arrested in it by the KGB. Yep. And it's like, you're like, wait, what? Yep. And so then we go down that, you know, we have some fun, I guess, with that and go down that rabbit totally. hole. So, um, yeah, that's one. That's, that's just, that's what's so cool about um, 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 what really happened. It just, there's so many different stories you're bouncing around. Keeps it really, really entertaining. It's really Good. great. Thank you. Um, yeah. I want to ask you about one more episode, uh, Black Dog. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this episode appeared to be very personal, not only because you are appropriately infatuated with Churchill, mm. but also because you've dealt with depression in your life. Mm -hmm. And that's what Black Dog alludes to um, Churchill's supposed uh, mm. depression. Um, so that was a very personal experience for you, that episode? Or? That episode is, a, is on the more personal side. Um, it's also, I'd like to point out, our lowest listened episode what is people by far <laughs> what is, are people worn out with churchill what's no i on? i have different theories on it but what's, i what's i you? mean all of our uh, i i i my thinking is that if, if you look at season one anyway mm. it's muhammad ali chris christie bridgegate yep. michael jordan britney spears princess diana that's five yep. and winston churchill yeah 
So Churchill goes the furthest back in time, yep. and it's about depression. Mm -hmm. So on paper, <laughs> it's like, which I'm, one do I'm, I want to listen to? Yeah. Maybe, you know, the guy from World War II who seems like a bit of a, you know, bloke is like, and his depression isn't like how I want to fuel my Monday morning ride to the office. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not as quite escapism, especially if people are dealing with, with their own issues. And yeah, and like if that. they're not, yeah. it's like they're having a good day, and now <laughs> i got to listen to the host of the show, who normally makes it about someone else's ride, make it about his own issues, and i got enough shit going on. Yeah. Um, I think that... Well, they're, well, they're fucking up, because it's a great episode. Well, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You there know what I'm go. talking about? There we go. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I've... So I had... Um, that we need to work on on our language for uh, mental health in general. But mm -hmm. what I get, yeah. what I would call dysthymia, what I think most would consider chronic depression, uh, since I can remember uh, something that I manage uh, or try to manage uh, every day, and someone that I'd always looked up to was Winston Churchill mm -hmm. because. He had struggled with depression. Yeah. And I, I think, this is my own little opinion, but I think that people with chronic depression or mental health issues in that, under that umbrella or in that ballpark, if you will, are perfect people for when shit's about to hit the fan. That's, I was going to go there. Oh, really? Go of, there, one yeah. Of, one of the things that you talk about is how depression in certain ways can almost be an asset, especially yeah. for a leader, because you're dealing yeah. with so much shit all the time. Yeah. And, so, I mean, in Churchill's case, it was, he was battling his, his depression, maybe, and then, you know, Nazis. Yeah. So there's, that's and I, wild. If it, wasn't, if it wasn't depression, it was, it was something. Yeah. And I think for a guy like Churchill... And I think a lot of people who have depression or, or some form of it and are managing it, to me, the opposite of depression isn't happiness. It's being active. Mm -hmm. It's being able to get up in the morning and do something. Yep. And so I think with someone like Churchill, or let's just take it outside of Churchill. You take anyone and they're severely depressed and every day they're, they're kind of really it's kind of a battle to get through it. And, and so if you tell them, all right, well, you're in charge of battling the Nazis and saving the free world mm -hmm. uh, from annihilation, I think to a guy with, with depression or something like it, it's sort of like, all right, I mean, yeah. the worst thing that happens is I wake up tomorrow morning and I'm yeah. fucking miserable, yeah. and that's sort of the yeah. case anyway. Yeah, getting so, out of bed might have been harder than, than this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is, kind yeah. of. Um, and so... Uh, if if anyone can like face an onslaught of a harsh reality, mm -hmm. it's probably someone who goes through it on an everyday basis yeah. and won't be intimidated by it. Yeah. This is totally like a you know this is an uninformed this is a somewhat informed opinion. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not. You know, uh, there's plenty of leaders who have not dealt with yes, melancholy that totally. do just fine. This, so is, this could be specific to this instance um, as well. Did it mess yeah. you up a little bit? Because uh, you were, uh, you found so, uh, a lot of inspiration in Churchill. Did it mess you up that uh, you might have not been facing like depression like you assumed originally? I think for me that episode was more about what I what I took away from it more was how in the in the world of mental health we are still so far behind on having the right set of words to use. Mm -hmm. And no the fact that we're using the word even depression, like depression is a word that we use for so many, like there's, there's tropical storm, like depressions are yeah. like a, a wind pattern <laughs> yeah, even. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's just this invisible disorder, disease that you can't see which is already a problem mm -hmm. in, in a way, mm -hmm. and we don't have the words to use. And so Churchill was drinking heavily from an early age. Uh, he might have had what we'd consider like bipolar two. Mm -hmm. For me, the fact that as it turns out, depression may have not been the right term wasn't like, oh shit, this whole time, I, my, this guy that I looked up to doesn't even have depression. It was more of like, well, he ha something was going on there. Yeah, totally. He wasn't sort of, uh, he wasn't, didn't live a, a mentally healthy life. Yeah. 
And so for me, it was still inspiring. It was more of like, what were you used now to diagnose these sorts of things, which is the DSM-5 is, is just, it's old. Yeah. It's, it's an old way of doing things. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you look, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I could, I could go, I yeah. could, I could yeah. go on for a while, totally. but, um, it sort of reminds me of in, you know, I did a baseball movie years ago and, uh, was that the one where uh, it was a is that the deaf school? No, that was football. That was right? the football What's team. What's the baseball one? I'm, uh, I, I did a, I don't know. I yeah. did a movie for ESPN called The Zena Bobby V. Yep. And uh, is that the one that cannot be released right yeah. now? Yeah. There's footage. Okay. Yeah, Tell yeah. me what that's about. Yeah, I yeah, don't know. Yeah. yeah fucked. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> shit. It's like Damn a. It. It's like the worst nightmare. <laughs> um, I made a movie after the nursing home where ESPN gave me the money to go live in Japan for eight months and make a movie about. Uh, Bobby Valentine, who's a well-known baseball manager. Mets manager. He was point. the Mets yeah. manager. He wore a disguise at a game. Wore a disguise. Got That's <laughs> <Yeah>. right. <laughs> exactly. Groucho Marx disguise. Yep. Um, character. Yeah. And I'd read an article when I was in high school that he was coaching now in Japan, and baseball is actually the number one sport in Japan. Yeah. And he was the first American to ever win a Japan series. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't just win in Japan. He also studied the language, ate the food, mm -hmm. uh, and had shown a great deal of respect to their culture, which they really, really took yeah, to, yeah. and in turn became a demigod. Yeah, like he was a hero over there. Hero. Right. Yeah, yeah, beer yeah, named yeah, after yeah. him, yeah. Bo Beer, Burger named after him, <laughs> Bobby's Burger Street named after him, which I lived right near. And I went out there for eight months, made a movie about mm -hmm. him. This is a very long way of getting back to the DSM-5. Sure. But, uh, and you would see scouts who would be there, a lot of times American scouts, and they'd sit there with their in the stands with their clipboard, and they'd be watching a game and potential players that they could that could come to the states, Japanese mm -hmm. guys that mm -hmm. they thought could play for the states, and they'd have their clipboard and they lean back, and you could see on their on their kind of one sheet, um, you know, running, mm. and it would be like one to ten or speed mm -hmm. one to ten or um, uh, bat strength or different variables that you're looking out for. And it's almost like if, if seven out of the 10, you know, are, are checks, mm -hmm. like he's good at this, he's good at this, he's good at this. Then let's look at him to play in our ball club yeah. in the States. Mm -hmm. And now what exists in baseball and something that Bobby would preach a lot is money ball, which is a much more yeah, complicated way yeah. of looking at yeah. things. And Absolutely. you're not just going through a fucking checkbox yeah. to determine who you're going to spend $20 yeah. million dollars those, on. Those guys who are with the checkbox are dinosaurs now in baseball, yeah. And that's what they are in a lot of ways in the world of psychiatry uh, right now because they're still using a fucking checkbox yeah. to determine your mental health status. Mm -hmm. So if you say you wake up and it feels like a rainy day, all right, one. And it's literally, I think it's something like, and we should look this up, but it's something like seven out of 12 mm -hmm. or seven out of 10, and you're, yep, you're chronically depressed, or yeah. yep, you're bipolar too. So we're using this obsolete method when we could have so much more information, and I'm not, I'm not blaming anyone. The people who put together DSM-5 are all well-intentioned people. Yeah, They're sure. also all uh, like five white guys, yeah. so there's something to be said for that, but yeah. um, uh, it, it's still using a very outdated technique, and we're talking about about people that could really, you know, we're talking about people around the world that are sick, yeah, you know, a lot uh, of them. really, really badly sick. Yeah. And we're using this fucking manual that, um, that is just out. Yeah. I'm saying the same thing a few times over, no, but it's just, always, it's, but it's just important. outdated. It's important. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's, it's yeah. important. And it's also, you know, it's, it's just, it's disappointing, but it's something that we can, um, yeah. I feel, I feel like there's some conversations happening uh, these days, at least, that if people are, you know, like we are right here, this is more complex. We need to, you know, we need more language for this. We need to address it in a different way. It's so. crazy to me that it's still at that point. I'm being a little negative right now, but sure. it's still at the point of the conversation is being applauded. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's weird. Okay. Like, yeah, I we fucking, should be talking about yeah. different methods that have been right, analyzed, right. different ways we can approach right. dealing with this. Yeah. Like, I fucking love 
Kevin Love, and mm. it's and that what he and I'm I haven't thought about this before, so it's always dangerous to kind of be thinking out loud yeah. on on a, in an interview, I suppose. Yeah. But who cares? No, whatever. Um, it's for. Yeah, um, work it out. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I I love he kind of him and and what's the Demarcus? Uh, who's the guy in the Raptors? Uh, DeRozan. DeRozan. Yeah. I think those two guys have have taken uh, big steps. There yep. was a guy in the Rockets years ago who couldn't fly and he ended up not even because oh, yeah. of anxiety yeah. there's people who who are talking about it i think what would be quite exceptional if, if i don't say so myself is if they can if it's not just talking about it but the next step for for leaders like that is to yeah. talk about how it can actually be you know the next step totally the next book i'm actually um we put out some books through across the margin okay it's a. Uh, he was a semi-pro basketball player, and he was actually, he went to Oak Hill Academy. I don't know if you know that. He yeah, of course. He played with Carmelo. He yeah. was on the trajectory. He was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. The guy had a great career, uh, and it was derailed by mental illness, so we're going to have that out by the end of the year. Oh, Should wow. Go, yeah. And who's he? He's Ian Johnson. So he's, he's he went to Davidson, where it's just oh, really? kind of like went in right before Steph Curry. He was good. Yeah, he was, Davidson's he was, legit. He was, yeah, he was sick. He was awesome, so that just came to mind. Huh, um, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, and he was and he was on the cover of he was he was one of those guys you know when they um, oh they in do the top like, tier well, yeah well the uh, when they're about to start the um, NCAA tournament they'll grab a bunch of players from each team and put on the cover so right right yeah, right yeah so it's interesting it's I mean definitely his you know his issues he had and like what was going on through his mind as he's as he's you know going through his career is it was fucking him up and it's it's wild it's a very vulnerable book so I'm, I'm we're very proud to. He was getting excited. You mentioned Kevin Love made me think of it. When Kevin Love started talking mm-hmm. about it, he's like, I can't wait to get involved in this discussion. And, mm-hmm. you know, kind of, you know, he's, he's, he's nervous to put himself out there, but he yeah. thinks it's going to help. And he thinks there's other people going through what he went through. And it and, uh, should be interesting. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I look forward cool. to that. Um, let me ask you, this first season was six episodes. Mm. Uh, and you guys bumped it up. You're at mm-hmm. 16 now. What do we have to look forward to? Uh, so we just did the fourth one, right? That was uh, the Lost King about yeah, King, King John the Second of John, France, John the Good, John the Good. Yeah. Did he really have a full boat full of wine? Yeah, yeah. So I'm always picking up on the little things. Yeah, like, that was another line mess- uh, <laughs> in, in, in passing. These, these, yeah. the, there's always these little things. I'm like, talk about the boat of wine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, he taught. So this is he's a good example of how I I have, and I'm very grateful for this incredible freedom here mm-hmm. because. Episode one was about the Williams sisters and mm-hmm. s- accusations of, of cheating. Uh, episode two was about sonic warfare in Cuba, which has been talked a lot about in the news, and s- some people have missed it. Uh, three was a box office flop, mm-hmm. uh, John Carter, Hollywood. Uh, our episode coming up this week is about Dave Chappelle and what happened when he left Comedy Central. Awesome. Nice. And, and then our episode, and, and then a lot of others about topics you'd know, which I can get to, but... Yep. Uh, yeah, then then I came in one day and was like, so we're going to do an episode about this king that no one's heard of. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really fit the it's format another, of the show it's at another all. another one that's going to get those Winston Churchill yeah, ratings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I was just reading up and I uh, on, a, on a king in, in England uh, and accidentally started reading about this other king and then realized this other king has been missed, has been lost in the history books. Yep. And he was king of France for 14 years. He wasn't Scaramucci. He mm-hmm. was he was there. Mm-hmm. And he was captured by the British, and I don't want to give the story away, but he yeah. essentially really enjoyed his captivity, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so he ended up going back. It's so uh, wild, yeah. But yeah, yeah so he owned his country, yeah. And yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, when does this air? Um, in next week. So we'll have so the Chappelle episode is probably going to be out then, right? Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, right so around the same day. Right yeah. around the same yeah. day. Yeah. Yep. So uh, Dave Chappelle, and then we're going to do an episode on the Twenty Seven Club, mm-hmm. um, which is you know everyone who passed, all of the different musicians and artists oh, who've wow. passed away at Twenty Seven. Yeah. So Brian Jones, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, Jimi Hendrix, mm-hmm. uh, Morrison. Amy Winehouse, yep, Amy, and yeah. uh, and then there's a lot of people, you know, Mac Miller was 26, yeah. uh, Britney Spears, when she had her kind of um, issues, yeah. uh, 26, Heath Ledger, 28, Do you ba- talk about Bas- Mac? Yeah, 27. Um, I'm still writing it, but oh, yeah, okay. maybe I will, actually, yeah. now that I think about it. Yeah, um, yeah that, and so... Um, That's cool. I can't, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, that, yeah. that one's interesting. A lot yeah. of people thought it 
think of the 27 Club as sort of a media, media manufacturer yeah. term. Are you finding out there's more to it? There's a lot more to yeah, it. Cool. And there's, there's actually a lot of reason to think that one could make the argument that not it makes sense, but yes, people who have uh, inordinate, inordinately high are, are just people who are really fucking famous, yeah. dealing with drugs, f- drugs, fame, alcohol. Uh, intense in, genius creatives. In, intense well. genius yeah. creatives. Uh, usually elements of money and how that mm. disrupts family and friend relationships. It's almost like, yeah, a lot of people would die at 20, would be dying at 27, yeah. uh, especially because of the science. And this is what I've been finding more and more of is a science of, um, I think it's called the prefrontal cortex in your mind is, is still developing much later into your twenties than we had previously thought. Oh, well. So it, it, again, it, it almost makes sense in, in that, uh, it's not like we have a fully formed brain at 24 or 25. Mm-hmm. It's still changing. Wow. Uh, and so that is, uh, that's the topic. Yeah. Uh, there's this incredible story that I heard that I'm trying to get more into. That would be one of our next episodes about Boris Yeltsin. I was going to ask, is the Boris Yeltsin pizza drunk story? Yeah. Kind of, is that happening? That's happening. Awesome. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you mentioned it in one. So again, he um, he was it during the Clinton presidency. He was drunk and trying to get uh, a pizza order to him. Yeah, Secret Service found him on the streets of D.C. So wasted, ordering pizza <laughs> and looking for a cab. Amazing. Uh, at least that's what we've been told. Okay. So I need. I'm now trying to sort it. out what exactly. Uh, <laughs> and it's also. I um, mean. I'm not sure I've been more excited for a podcast than the Boris Yeltsin. Oh, good, because that was one. <laughs> you can use that title if you want. Uh, what was what did you say? Boris Yeltsin pizza drunk episode. Pizza drunk. Yeah. We should just call it that. Yeah. It's better than what we have now, actually. <laughs> um, and it's also kind of, I mean, it's just, that's just fucking crazy. And yeah. it's also, uh, this, it's a serious, it's serious stuff, but it's also like, you know, Boris Yeltsin on January 1st, 2000, mm-hmm. Stepped down, and Vladimir Vladimir Putin took yeah. his place, yep. and so it's kind of like that guy was the one president they had during their attempt at democracy, yep. and that's just crazy to think like that was that was the that's guy. Cool. So you get deep on that, and you get kind of yeah, you know, trying kind of a transition into what Russia became. And, yep. And Putin's uh, take, yep. takeover of the country and possibly the world. And then we do another one about the famous uh, photo that was taken in the Situation Room during the Bin Laden raid. Oh, cool. So it's sort of like what really happened during that raid yep. and around the time of that photo, particularly through the, van- through, through the lens of the people who are in that photo who we don't know. Ah. So we've heard about, we've heard Bill Gates' point of view, Hillary Clinton, yep. Barack Obama, da, 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 da. Yeah. But we get like you pinpoint all the others. In yeah, the like the guy who you only see his shoulder. Uh-huh. We got that guy. Oh, you, need sh- you got shoulder. You got shoulder guy. <laughs> we got shoulder guy. Amazing. We got the guys that you're looking at, and you're like, I don't. Who's the, who's that? Yeah. And we get their point of view on things, That's and then cool. also a couple people who were there, but like a little bit down the hallway, so they're not in the photo hallway at all. Guy. You got hallway guys. Hallway well. guys who are also, as it turns out, pretty important people. Yeah, I'm sure. Amazing. Well, uh, you, tons to look forward yeah. to. I love how deep you dig on all these subjects. I, I love the podcast. I'm so excited to shine a light on it. Um, thank you, man. I appreciate I, it. I really can, uh, I can't thank you enough for talking to me about it. It's great. No, thank you. Cool. Appreciate it. All and right, uh, thank you, everyone out there, for taking another trip with us across the margin. Hello, <laughs> This podcast is in the loop, the legion of Osiris podcasts. Osiris is creating a community that connects people like you with live experiences and podcasts about artists and topics you love. Get in the loop at OsirisPod.com. Podcast.